Good afternoon, and thank you for participating in today's live webinar, exclusively available for BMO Investor Line clients. My name is Alfred Lee, and I'm a Vice President, Portfolio Manager, and Investment Strategist with BMO Asset Management, Inc. Today, I will be discussing key ETF strategies for 2013 and how self-directed investors can potentially implement these strategies as part of their portfolio. So why don't we get, begin with the presentation, which is essentially um, what I discussed, is uh, positioning your portfolio based on the market and uh, economic themes that we're currently seeing right now for 2013 and, and beyond. Before I get into that, however, uh, what I want to do is just give a quick update on the ETF market, both in Canada and globally. Um, obviously, uh, most of the uh, listeners here have uh, probably heard about ETFs or exchange-traded funds. And the ETF market has really grown uh, exponentially over the last um, five to ten years. Globally right now, we are looking at $2 trillion in assets under management and 2000, or roughly 4,700 products listed across the world. In Canada, the growth profile has been very similar with um, 270 ETFs and more than $55 billion in, in assets under management. And as you can see from the chart, the assets under management has really grown exceptionally since 2008. And uh, the reasons for that we'll get into in the next slide um, is because there are a lot of benefits that ETFs uh, provide investors in, in terms of their portfolio construction processes and also um, a lot of benefits in how ETFs can be implemented as, as part of uh, investors' uh, portfolio strategies. In terms of the market dynamics and, and how the industry has shifted or changed over the last several years, uh, there has been a number of providers um, entering the Canadian market space, whereas uh, several years ago there was only one major ETF provider in Canada. Now we're looking at seven different ETF providers in Canada, and at the end of the day, uh, you may be asking yourself whether you know more ETF products or more ETF providers is a good thing for the end investor. Uh, we certainly believe that, that that is good for the end investor. One, um, it, it provides a lot of in innovation to uh, the end investor, which means better solutions uh, for investors in terms of their portfolio construction process. And in addition to that, more competition also means uh, lower fees, which is also a good thing for the end investor. Um, so uh, to sum it up, the increasing number of ETFs is definitely a good thing for the end investor. Um, if you compare the ETF market today to even five years ago, um, the number of products out there available now allows investors, both um, institutional investors and retail and, and do-it-yourselfers, to build a portfolio that is a lot more robust now than it was even uh, five years ago. So some of the benefits of ETFs and really the driving forces in, in why ETFs have really grown um, over the last five to ten years is because um, there are a number of reasons, um, which may be very different um, if you're an institutional investor, an asset manager, uh, a retail advisor, or a do-it-yourselfer. Um, but what I want to do is just focus on five key themes, which I think are applicable to all investors, no matter um, what investment or what kind of investor you are. Uh, low management fees are obviously one of the uh, major reasons why ETFs have been popular. If you compare a Canadian equity fund or a Canadian mutual fund, which ranges between 1.5% to 2.5% in terms of management fee, uh, Canadian ETFs or ETFs in general tend to be a lot lower in terms of management fee. A Canadian equity fund, uh, for example, or a Canadian equity ETF, you could get for uh, roughly between 7 basis points to uh, 30 basis points in terms of annual management fee. And for those that um, are wondering, uh, one basis point is one one hundredth of a percent, so a lot lower than uh, traditional um, funds out there, such as mutual funds and also closed-end funds. Diversification is also another benefit of ETFs. Um, very similar to a mutual fund, when you buy an ETF, not only are you accessing um, one stock, you're, you're, you tend to get a portfolio of, uh, of different securities in there. Um, this applies to stock portfolios, sector portfolios, bond portfolios, uh, commodity portfolios, and there's also ETFs that are uh, multi-asset class ETFs that incorporate um, a number of different asset classes, which provides even more diversification. Tax efficiency is another reason why ETFs have been popular. Um, ETFs tend to be passive in nature. There are active ETFs out there, 
uh, but the majority of them tend to be passively managed. And because of that, the turnover in the portfolios tend to be lower, and that um, leads to less opportunities to crystallize on capital gains, uh, which makes ETFs more tax efficient than traditional uh, funds out there, such as mutual funds and, again, closed-end funds. Transparency is also another key in why ETFs have been popular. I think prior to the crisis, or the credit crisis in 2008, people didn't really care that much about transparency. Um, as long as the portfolio was going up or the value of the investment was going up, people didn't tended not to um, pay too much attention to the details. But during 2008, a lot of people you know, wanted to know how much exposure did they have to the U.S. financials, how much exposure did they have to uh, U.S. automakers and so on. So I think transparency at, at this point is very critical to, to investors. And with an ETF, you get daily transparency where – uh, the daily holdings are posted on the ETF provider's website, and this is um, a standard across the ETF industry. Intraday pricing is also um, a feature that is a benefit to um, you know, some of you investors that may want to trade more often. Uh, with intraday pricing, obviously, an ETF trades throughout the day. As long as the, as long as the market is open, uh, you could trade an ETF. For those that don't trade that often, um, you know, at least that option to trade throughout the day is available uh, to those investors should you need. But above all else, I think the reason why um, ETFs are really popular or we have really grown in the last several years is because ETFs are essentially access products. With ETFs, you could essentially access a number of different areas in, in the marketplace that were either previously tough to access or were inaccessible altogether, and that applies to even um, institutional investors. So um, with, the, with the development and innovation in the ETF world, that, that has really allowed uh, the do-it-yourselfer to play on an equal playing field with uh, institutional investors, and it has allowed you know, investors across the spectrum in, in building portfolios um, that are a lot more robust, adding a lot more asset classes to their portfolios compared to even uh, several years ago. So moving on to the bulk of the presentation, what I want to do is just focus on key investment themes for 2013. And what I want to do is just focus on you know, long-term trends, not, not short-term trends which you could uh, trade upon, uh, but trends that we believe uh, will persist in 2013 and, and potentially beyond there as well. So the key themes that I want to focus on is uh, interest rates, obviously interest rates, um, have been on a steady decline over the last two decades. And uh, now it looks like you know, interest rates have potentially bottomed. So how do you position your portfolio accordingly if, if interest rates were to rise? Um, also, I want to talk about traditional market cap weighted indexes. Are they the most efficient? And we'll explore some other um, weighting methodologies with indexes and ETFs as well and, and some of the benefits that those may provide to certain investors. Income is also... Um, a very consistent theme. Um, obviously, right now with aging demographics, a lot of people demand income in their portfolios. So we'll discuss reasons why income and, and yield-oriented strategies may continue to outperform and how to use ETFs in order to get access to some of these areas. And then finally, um, I know it talks a lot about income and, and defensive strategies, but also uh, I want to focus on some key growth ideas uh, in your portfolio. Obviously, um, especially for those investors that are near retirement, um, it is important to have a little bit of growth in your portfolio to offset uh, what we call the portfolio burn rate um, so it doesn't uh, allow your portfolio to shrink if you are constantly um, extracting from your, from your portfolio. So starting with the presentation, obviously the first theme, as I mentioned, is um, rising interest rates. Over the last 20 years, we've experienced an environment where Interest rates are basically gone from, you know, 20% in the, in the late 70s, early 80s, and have slowly declined ever since. Um, for those that, you, that do remember, in the late 70s, inflation was running out of control, and, and the central bankers, uh, most notably Paul Volcker at the time, uh, which is basically the equivalent to Ben Bernanke at the time, uh, basically he was brought in to rein in inflation, and, and what he did was took inflation or took interest rates up to 20%, and since that time, interest rates have dropped accordingly um, since that time. And, and that's been a major factor in driving um, 
equity prices and, and all asset prices up altogether. Not only has it been beneficial for equities, but it's been beneficial for uh, bonds and also commodities, commodities as well. We've seen one of the biggest bull markets on record in terms of the equity market where the Dow Jones basically increased uh, roughly 15, 1,500% between 1982 and 2002. So uh, definitely declining interest rates have, have been one of the major driving factors in, in uh, increasing the asset prices over the last two decades. What's, uh, what's been developing lately, however, is a, is a very interesting trend in my opinion, where um, if you take a closer look at the interest rate, so this chart over here is a look at the five-year Government of Canada yield. So what um, a bond issued by the Government of Canada uh, with a five-year maturity is currently yielding or currently paying at this time. And what you'll notice is that over time, what looks uh, to be happening is that um, that decline in interest rates is, is slowly start to stabilize. And uh, what you'll notice is that that downtrend has, has clearly been broken where interest rates now potentially are rising. So if the equity market continues to rally, as we've been seeing year to date, that's going to put a lot of upward pressure on interest rates and, and potentially cause this great rotation that everybody's talking about and um, cause a lot of people to move into um, equities and, and out of interest rate sensitive areas. So just to hammer out one more point on, on interest rates, uh, this chart over here is a, just a comparison of the yield curve and a closer look at how the yield curve has, has moved over the last five months. And as you can see from the red line, which is the yield curve five months ago, um, it's, it's, really call, it, it's really moved um, in a way in, in which what we call is uh, a steepening of the yield curve. As you can see from the... Um, the blue line, what you'll see is the long end of the yield curve has moved up, where the short end of the yield curve has moved down. So that basically implies that people believe that interest rates are going to move up faster than, uh, than most people think. So how do you position your portfolio accordingly in, in a potential rising interest rate environment? You know, we don't think interest rates are going to rise to 5% uh, or 10% overnight, but we do definitely believe that uh, interest rates at this point have, you know, close to bottom out and, and potentially will rise um, in the near future. If you talk to most economists out there, uh, they believe that interest rates are probably going to rise uh, some, sometime in late 2013 or sometime in the first half of 2014. Our personal belief is that we believe it's probably going to be sometime in early 2014, uh, potentially at the first Bank of Canada meeting. Um, so how do you position your portfolio in a rising interest rate environment? Obviously, fixed income still plays a very crucial part of your portfolio. Um, you know, I talked about this great rotation into equities. However, um, there still are a lot of macroeconomic concerns out there that could cause equity market volatility, which has been really muted over the last year, uh, to return to the markets. So bonds are a crucial part of an investment strategy, which you know, potentially acts as a hedge against that equity market volatility and allows investors to hedge out that you know, volatility that may return to the market. So um, one thing that we have been recommending in terms of bond exposure, however, is decreasing your exposure to interest rate sensitive areas. So in terms of the bond market, uh, this, this illustration on the bottom of the chart is um, a good way to depict which areas of the bond market are more sensitive to interest rates and which areas are less sensitive to interest rates. So long duration bonds are obviously more sensitive to interest rates and perhaps this, the best way to describe why is through an example. If I were to buy a bond with a 2% coupon uh, with a 30 year maturity and three years down the road, another uh, similar bond is issued with a 5% coupon, that bond that I bought uh, two to three years ago is not going to be attractive, as attractive compared to uh, the new bonds in the market. However, with a long duration bond, I'm, tr I'm stuck in that bond for a longer time period uh, with a lower coupon than the market is, than the market is paying. So because of that, uh, long duration bonds are more uh, sensitive to rising interest rates than short duration bonds. So what we have been recommending over the last um, six months or so is shortening your duration exposure, moving from uh, long duration bonds and mid duration bonds into shorter term uh, duration bonds. So 
there are a number of ETFs out there that allow investors to easily do so. And uh, fixed income ETFs uh, provide a lot of benefits to investors, such as uh, institutional pricing, uh, portfolio diversification, and um, it really allows investors to make those tactical adjustments to the portfolio with one easy trade. In terms of credit exposure, uh, government bonds tend to be a little bit more in interest rate sensitive compared to corporate bonds. And the reason why is because corporate bonds in Canada are considered what we call AAA bonds. So there is very little, little uh, credit risk in terms of Canadian issued bonds. Um, so really what they're, the price of Canadian bonds are just driven by um, interest rates and very little from credit. Um, corporate bonds, however, are, more, are, are less interest rate sensitive and more sensitive to uh, credit spreads or, or what we call uh, corporate conditions. So um, corporate bonds um, is an area that we have been recommending over the last uh, six months or so. We have been recommending investors to move a little bit of their exposure from government bonds into corporate bonds. And the reason why is because in this kind of a market environment where you know, economic data is suggesting that you know, conditions are improving. Um, if conditions are improving, it, that means interest rates are going up. And interest rates tend to go up when uh, the economic data or the business cycle improves and, and economic conditions improve as well. Um, and the reason why you want to own corporate bonds in in the environment when business conditions are improving is because those corporations that issue these bonds um, have a better probability of paying back their debt um, because their businesses are performing better. Um, so because of that, we have been recommending investors move into corporate bonds. And again, ETFs are, are a very simple way that investors can get exposure to corporate bonds and also make those quick tactical adjustments in their portfolio. Um, so there are a number of corporate bonds available or corporate bond ETFs available uh, in the Canadian market. And um, uh, so th that's another area that we have been recommending as well. Corporate bonds, short duration bonds, and also uh, short duration corporate bonds as well. Another area that has been gaining a lot of attention over the last several years is preferred shares. And for those that aren't aware of preferred shares, preferred shares are basically um, a hybrid investment vehicle that has characteristics uh, that combine uh, the characteristics of an equity and characteristics of, of a bond. So similar to an equity, uh, preferred share pays a dividend, um, but also similar to a bond, um, it, a preferred share also has a par value or maturity value and also pays um, a fixed distribution or a regular distribution over time. Um, however, the advantage of preferred shares over bonds is that its distributions are considered dividends, so they tend to be more tax efficient than um, bonds in general. So um, because of that, you know, I think a lot of people over the last several years have been looking for um, key characteristics in, in, in terms of their investments. They've been looking for less volatility than the um, equity market and also higher yields than the equity market as well. So preferred shares have both those characteristics and also they are more tax efficient than, than uh, than bonds in general, and they are a good uh, diversification tool in terms of mixing them with traditional asset classes, um, such as bonds and equities as well. So there, within Canada, there are a number of uh, different preferred shares um, structures. I'm not going to get too much into the details, but basically there are four basic types. There are straight perpetuals, uh, rate resets, retractables, and also floaters. Uh, the two main types are perpetuals and and uh, rate resets. And perpetuals basically pay a fixed distribution or fixed dividend over time as long as they remain outstanding, and they don't have a maturity value. But these uh, these preferred shares basically act as long long duration bonds, and they tend to be more um, sensitive to interest rates. Rate resets, however, are a, pref a type of preferred share. Uh, that has really grown in terms of, of a percentage of the market share in terms of the preferred share market over the last several years. And the reason why is because uh, with the rate reset preferred, uh, it pays a dividend that resets every five years. And if, if interest rates are going up, these, dividend, uh, these dividends for these rate resets will 
adjust upwards and um, adjust accordingly in a rising interest rate environment. So we do believe that rate free sets offer better interest rate or better protection again, again, uh, in a rising interest rate environment. So there are a number of uh, preferred share ETFs out there. Um, and, and again, I mean, an ETF is a good way to get preferred share, um, preferred share exposure because uh, with a preferred share ETF, you get uh, much better diversification than you could build on your own. Uh, with an ETF, it also allows investors, even institutional investors, to get better diversification than they could build on their own. So moving on to the next theme, uh, the next theme that I want to talk about was uh, market cap weighted indexes. I know when we talk about indexes and ETFs in general, most of them are constructed using a market cap weighting methodology. And a market cap weighting methodology is basically where larger companies make up a larger percentage of that index or that market. So um, a good example of, of you know, the, the potential dangers in a market cap weighted index is if you recall back in the late 90s and early 2000s where Nortel basically made up a big uh, portion of the index or, the, or a big uh, percentage of the TSX. Um, so, you know, back in those days, there definitely was a lot of concentration risk or single stock uh, concentration with even when you were to buy um, what is known as a you know, diversified product such as an index fund. Um, today, we don't have the same kind of um, same kind of concentration risk in, in terms of single stock risk. However, there is um, concentration risk in terms of, of sector exposure. So, if you look at the TSX, um, the TSX. If you talk to global investors, um, the TSX is known to be very niche, where it, where it's really made up of a lot of commodity related sectors, and also financials as well. So. Um, Financials, energy, and materials actually make up close to 75% of the market. So, um, when you invest in something like the uh, something like an index fund or an ETF that tracks the TSX, uh, what you're doing is basically making a concentrated bet in the market or a concentrated bet on these three sectors. And this concentrated bet has really worked out well over the last 10 years. And, and the reason why is because, you know, with the growth of the emerging markets and how they've been it be really just urbanizing their, their infrastructure and modernizing their, their infrastructure, that's really placed a lot of demand for commodities. But now, as emerging markets are looking more towards, um, more towards a different model and in, in, in how they want to focus more on internal consumption where their own population consumes their own goods and services, uh, they're going to demand less on commodities. So that's potentially going to cause a headwind for um, you know, areas like the TSX or commodity-related markets, uh, which tend to be more exposed to things like, um, you know, areas in, in the commodity market, such as materials and also energy as well. So um, one way or one consideration that investors should make is that um, is they, should, they should give it some thought in how they want to get exposure to Canadian equities. We certainly do believe that there are a lot of attractive opportunities in Canadian equity still, um, but just, um, you know, you should put some thought in how do you want to get that exposure? Do you want to get it through uh, a market cap weighted index, uh, equal, equal weight index, or do you want to get it through some kind of other weighting methodology? One weighting methodology that has been uh, popular over the last several years is low volatility ETFs. Um, in the U.S., uh, there has been a lot of um, asset growth in, in terms of low volatility ETFs. In Canada, um, there hasn't been the same kind of asset growth, but um, you know, the benefits of low volatility ETFs are, are definitely the same in Canada as they are in, in the U.S. as well. Um, so with low volatility ETFs, what they try to do is provide exposure to the equity, to, to the equity market, uh, but with less volatility, as, as its name suggests. So. Um, why a big part of the reason why they've gained a lot of interest is because a lot of academic studies over the last several years have actually um, found that low volatility strategies outperform the market in general. And that's a little bit counterintuitive, considering that you know we've all been taught that um, in order to generate higher returns in your portfolio, uh, the only way to do so is is adding more risk to your portfolio. 
but with low volatility ETFs and a lot of these academic studies, to actually show that less volatile stocks outperform not only um, in the short term or not only over the last several years, but also over the long term as well. Um, so there are a number of low volatility ETFs in, in Canada that are available to investors. Um, so as I outlined in, in this uh, chart over here, there's three main um, products out there, uh, one offered by BMO, uh, one by PowerShares, and one by iShares. So the methodology in, in how they uh, kind of derive their portfolios or construct their portfolios and how they arrive at um, you know, a portfolio that is less volatile than the market is, is different. Um, uh, BMO, uh, they use beta as a, as a measure for volatility. Um, PowerShares uses standard deviation, and iShares uses uh, portfolio optimization uh, method. So as you can see from the returns, um, the returns are very uh, tend to be very similar to the overall market in general. Um, but the big story with low volatility ETFs is with uh, the volatility itself. So as you can see from the standard deviation, which is a measure of, of volatility with, with, an, uh, with an investment, uh, what you'll notice is that all three ETFs were successful in delivering that um, equity or Canadian equity exposure, uh, but with less volatility. As you can see, all three products had a lower standard deviation than the TSX in general. And anytime you're making an, an investment, it's also a good idea to understand how efficient is that investment. And a good way to determine that is through what we call a sharp ratio or a return to risk ratio. So the more return you get for the amount of risk you take on, the higher that ratio, the more efficient that investment is. So as you can see, those three um, low volatility ETFs are actually more efficient than the TSX um, in general. So um, um, so far since, since their launch, they have been delivering in, in terms of what they claim, which is basically a more efficient or more efficient exposure to the underlying market, which in this case is Canadian equities. So moving on to the third theme, uh, another theme that we think is going to persist in the marketplace for quite some time is, is, um, is income. Um, a lot of people right now are demanding income. There's been a thirst for yield right now. And if you uh, compare the market right now compared to uh, pre-2008, pre-2008 a lot of investors focused on um, gains and growth. Now, however, um, the areas that have actually outperformed are more income and more yield-oriented areas. And the reason why is because uh, with the aging baby boomers, um, a lot of those people are nearing retirement or already entered retirement. And because of that, they've been de-risking their portfolios and looking for areas to help fund them through the retirement years. And because of that, um, that's been a major driving force behind why uh, higher yielding areas have outperformed uh, the market over the last several years. So we do believe that that is a trend that's going to persist for quite some time. Um, this chart on the slide over here is a good depiction in, in, in describing why, um, you know, you know what the, why um, that yielding or yield-oriented areas are going to potentially outperform uh, going forward. So as you can see from the, the, uh, the hump in these curves, uh, what you'll notice is where, the, uh, where that bulge in that um, chart is, that's basically the bulk of the, the demographics. And what you'll notice is that over time, uh, the bulk of the population has been aging. And because of that, uh, yield-oriented ideas will probably likely outperform um, over the long term. And ETFs are a good way to get access to a lot of yield-oriented ideas. Um, not only can you get access to dividend or, or dividend-yielding um, ETFs, um, uh, but also you could get access to a lot of areas such as U.S. high yield, um, emerging market debt, preferred shares, as we mentioned. Um, all of those are more yield-oriented ideas, and you could get those exposures through the many ETFs available um, in the marketplace. And last but not least, um, one theme that we've been, uh, we've been recommending to some clients is uh, growth-oriented ideas. Um, obviously, I've focused on um, income being a major theme and aging demographics um, being a major theme and driving these income-oriented ideas uh, going forward. Um, however, um, it does make sense to have 
carefully selected areas that provide growth in the portfolio. And the reason why is because um, for those investors that are near retirement or already in retirement, um, those investors are going to rely more and more so on their uh, on their portfolio in order to fund their retirement years. And uh, the more they re- retire or the more they rely on their portfolios, um, the faster they're going to burn through the portfolio, which is what we call the portfolio burn rate. And um, in order to offset some of that burn rate, um, what what investors should uh, consider is having some areas or some exposure to carefully selected growth er- or growth-oriented ideas to offset some of that burn rate. So the next few slides, we'll just talk about some uh, key, er- key areas in the market that we think that uh, potentially provide opportunities um, that provide growth to a portfolio. So Canadian industrials is, um, uh, in our opinion, is uh, an area that we believe is well well positioned in, in uh, uh, given where we are in the economic cycle right now. Uh, typically, for a lot of investors that follow those sector rotation strategies, what they'll find is um, industrials tend to outperform at this stage of the economic cycle. And, and the reason why is because you know economic data suggests that uh, the economy is slowly improving right now. And as the economy improves, um, a lot of people uh, will need to, you know, transport their goods and services to to the final destinations. Um, also, you know, that's going to create a more demand for things like railroads. Um, also, things like airlines are potentially could see a pickup as business business activity improves. Um, more people are going to require business traveling. Um, there's going to be more machinery to be built, and and so on and so forth. Uh, so we do believe that. Um, Canadian-related industrials are well positioned um, given where we are in the economic cycle. So, you know, ETFs. There are a number of ETFs that provide access to um, industrial-related sectors. Uh, there's one Canadian industrial ETF, and there's also a number of ETFs that provide exposure to uh, U.S.-related industrials and also uh, global-related industrials that that trade on the U.S. exchanges as well. Another key theme that we believe will uh, potentially outperform going forward for the next several months is U.S. banking. Uh, U.S. banking is essentially the epicenter to the credit crisis in 2008, Um, but we've definitely seen some improving conditions within that space um, over the last uh, six months to to the last year. And uh, over the last uh, six months, we've been recommending investors Increase their exposure to U.S. banking, and, and the reason why is because, or the ma- major trigger point in what made us make make this recommendation was basically uh, the U.S. stress tests, um, which were performed in in March of last year. A lot of the U.S. banks that basically borrowed money from the U.S. Federal Reserve uh, were subject to testing last year, and these tests basically allowed the Fed to to monitor how healthy were these financial institutions. And they want to test whether they could withstand another um, stress to, um, to the market and, and the economy. And, and uh, the majority of the banks tested uh, came back um, with passing scores. And not only that, but a, lo- a number of the banks were not only given the approval by the Federal Reserve to Im- increase their share buyback activity, but also their um, dividend payment plans as well. So that uh, was step one in, in creating a, a tailwind behind uh, U.S. financials and, and U.S. banks. Um, but also we've seen a number of economic data points that suggest that U.S. banking is, is further improving, such as uh, home prices. Um, home prices throughout the uh, recovery since 2009 um, continue to drift downwards, so prices continue to decrease. Uh, but in 2012, as you can see from the chart, uh, one major turning point is that uh, home prices now are um, improving or increasing in a number of areas in the U.S. So we do believe that that is going to be a benefit for a lot of the uh, U.S. banks. Unemployment is also starting to go down, um, and that's also a positive for banks in general uh, because as the business environment improves, as the economy improves, that tends to be good for uh, banking, people are going to need more um, loans. They're going to need more uh, mortgages and so on. And um, 
banks provide those goods and services. Also, mortgage delinquencies, this is a, a major benefit to especially some of those regional banks um, that tends to be very common in, in the U.S. Uh, a lot of those regional banks are focused on, on uh, mortgage lending, which is a big part of their business. And as mortgage delinquencies go down, that's obviously a positive for a lot of the uh, U.S. banks and especially those regional banks. So there are a number of uh, ETFs that provide exposure to uh, U.S. banks. Um, that trade in the U.S. Uh, one benefit of some of the ETFs that trade in Canada is that they do provide a currency hedge. Uh, so by hedging currency, you are able to eliminate that volatility uh, between the Canadian, uh, the Canadian dollar and the U.S. dollar. So that is also a consideration uh, for those investors that don't want uh, that currency volatility. So it really depends, or that currency hedging decision really depends on uh, the individual investor. And that basically sums up the presentation. Um, um, I'll, I'll now take the opportunity to field any questions our audience may have regarding this presentation. Uh, but due to the high volume of participants in today's webinar, I may not have the opportunity to address all the questions. So if there is something you'd like to follow up on, please contact Pimo Investor Line. Um, to ask a question at the end of the webinar, please hover to the top of your screen in a toolbar will appear and click the Q&A uh, button.